One of my favorite authors is C.S. Lewis. And one of my favorite of C.S. Lewis's articles is entitled, Christianity and Culture. Now, Lewis makes an observation in this article that relates directly to what we've been talking about this week on Back to the Bible, and that is seeing the Father through the cross. Listen to what he says. There is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second, is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. Now, in the clash between good and evil, there have been wars and skirmishes galore. But never was there a battle between God and Satan like the battle we call Calvary. Never was every square inch, every split second, claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. Seeing the Father through the cross is seeing God as victor over the arch enemy. The cross, coupled with the resurrection three days later, forged the greatest unseen battle in history and the most marvelous victory for God over Satan. Now, to better understand this victory, today we want to take some time doing some leapfrogging through the Bible. We want to see some earlier skirmishes between God and Satan. We have to view these as minor assaults compared with the bloody battle of Calvary. Let's go back to the very beginning and see the Eden skirmish, the skirmish that took place in the Garden of Eden. You know, God had placed his special creations, Adam and Eve, in a very beautiful garden. He called it Eden. Things there must have been idyllic. In fact, only heaven could be better than the Garden of Eden was. But Satan came to paradise one day. He took the form of a serpent, you remember. He hatched a plan, and he drew mankind into his rebellion. The battle plan was clear. Satan would deceive Eve, and Adam would foolishly follow her deception. And Satan's plan worked. Genesis 3.6 records the first skirmish between God and Satan. Man had sinned, and Satan knew he had won. Or at least he thought he had won. God disciplined his sinning pair by driving them from Eden, and he cursed them because he's a holy God. He cursed the serpent, and he cursed the ground for their sake. Nevertheless, God left them with a message of hope. God promised Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Now that was the first volley. The first volley fired, and man was wounded. But man would ultimately be the victor. God would see to that. So from the first skirmish in the Garden of Eden, let's skip forward now. Let's leapfrog to what I like to call the palace skirmish. Another memorable battle between God and Satan occurred not in the garden, but in Jerusalem's own palace. You see, God had promised that Messiah and Savior, Jesus Christ, would be born as son of David. He would be a legitimate heir in the Davidic dynasty. Now, in order to fulfill that promise, nothing could ever interrupt David's dynasty. But something almost did. In the history of Judah, the darkest days prior to the Babylonian captivity must have been the reign of Jehoram. Maybe you remember his reign. Jehoram was that wicked king of Judah. He married Ataliah, the daughter of Israel's wicked king, Ahab and Queen Jezebel. Now, that's not exactly the kind of family tree you want to be grafted into the line of Christ. But it happened. Ataliah brought with her all the sin that she was raised on in Ahab's palace. And it was quickly established in the palace at Jerusalem, just as it was in Samaria. Well, when Jehoram died, the people of Judah made his youngest son Ahaziah king. But when Ahaziah died, his wicked mother, Ataliah, saw her opportunity to seize the throne. She destroyed all the royal heirs of the house of Judah, and she proclaimed herself queen. Well, at that point, I guess Satan must have thought he'd won a great victory. If all the royal heirs were slain, that means there could be no Messiah. There could be no Savior. 
there could be no Jesus because there would be no heirs to David's throne. Uh, but you remember the story. Second Chronicles 22 verse 11 says that Jehoshabeth, a daughter of the king, took Joash, one of the royal heirs, and she hid him in the house of God for six years. Well, suddenly Satan was defeated. The boy Joash was proclaimed king. Ataliah was deposed and she was slain. I suppose in the history of Judah, this was the closest call of all. But God had defeated Satan in the battle of the palace. Well, we have leapt from the Garden of Eden to the palace in the Old Testament. Let's go up to the New Testament now to the Bethlehem skirmish. Another close call. One that came one night in a little town called Bethlehem. Here prophecy was fulfilled. Here the dawn of a new age occurred. Here the Messiah was born. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Here the Son of God became a man so that men could become the sons of God. It was here in the little town of Bethlehem that a frightful skirmish took place between the forces of good and the forces of evil, between God and Satan. You remember the story. Satan used Herod the Great as his instrument. He attempted to kill the baby Jesus. In other words, Satan attempted to do directly what Athaliah, his servant, attempted to do in the Old Testament indirectly. Athaliah failed. And, and Satan would fail this time as well. Listen to Matthew chapter 2, verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. And he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem, and in all its districts, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Well, it sounds like Satan thinks he's really won this time. And if Mary and Joseph had not been warned, divinely warned, in a dream, probably Satan would have won. But having been warned by God, Mary and Joseph had already fled from Bethlehem to Egypt. What could have been the war turned out just to be another skirmish and another defeat for Satan. Do you think Satan will give up? Well, he doesn't give up on you, does he? And he's not going to give up on the Lord Jesus. Satan won't give up. He was determined to keep Jesus Christ from the cross. And that old devil continued his attacks throughout the life of the Lord Jesus. Now let's leap forward in the life of the Lord Jesus to see the temptation skirmish. Matthew records that three times Satan attempted to negate Jesus' claim to be Savior through temptation. The first temptation came after Jesus had just finished a 40-day fast. Now, it's likely you have never had a 40-day fast. I've not had a 40-day fast. It's not something we do very often, and I'm not sure it's something we could sustain our lives through. Nonetheless, Jesus did, and Satan knew Jesus would be very, very hungry. So what did he do? He tempted the Lord Jesus by asking him to turn stones into bread. Ah, uh, but Jesus wouldn't do any magic for the devil. He only reminded Satan that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Well, the next temptation found Jesus at the pinnacle of the temple, likely the southeast corner of the temple area in Jerusalem. This was a mighty drop from the high pinnacle of the temple down into the deep valley below it. And again, Satan wanted magic, the magic of angels this time. And again, Jesus refused. In fact, Jesus reminded Satan, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Matthew chapter 4, verse 7. You know, it must have torn Satan up to have Jesus remind him that Jesus is God. Well, the final temptation saw Satan's complete defeat when Jesus refused to bow down to the devil on the Mount of Temptation. You see, Jesus did not need to bow to Satan to control all the kingdoms of the world. 
He knew what John would record in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. What a mighty verse that is. Revelation eleven fifteen. Satan was foiled again. He was losing time now to defeat Jesus before Calvary. He had to give it his best shot. And where would he do that? Well, let's look at another place that the battle raged, and that was in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Gethsemane skirmish. Satan knew if he could get Jesus to think about all the agony, to think about the pain and the shame of Calvary, maybe he could trick Jesus. Maybe he could trick him into disobeying the Father, skipping out of the Garden that night. It was the devil's last chance before Calvary. Well, you know the story. It's recorded in Matthew chapter 26. Jesus' soul was sorrowful, but a sorrowful soul was nevertheless an obedient soul. He prayed, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Matthew chapter 26, verse 39. It was the will of the Father that Jesus go to the cross, and Jesus would obey. Satan had lost again. The Eden skirmish, the skirmish in the Garden of Gethsemane, all the skirmishes through the life of Jesus and even at his birth, Satan had lost them all. Now that brings us to the final skirmish, the Calvary skirmish. Satan must have viewed the cross with mixed emotions, don't you think? He reveled in the pain that Jesus had to endure. In fact, he heightened the shame of Jesus' crucifixion at every turn. Satan took secret delight in every slap of the Savior's face. Each time they spit on his face. Every time they scourged his back. Every hair they plucked out of his beard. Satan was there, all right, and he was rejoicing. He was cheering on those who cruelly acted toward the Lord Jesus in a way that was unparalleled in history. Oh, yes, Satan was enjoying the crucifixion very much. With each blow of the hammer, with each shriek of pain, Satan must have thought he had won and won big. But Satan knew enough about the plan of God that he must also have feared Calvary significantly. He must have feared Calvary about as greatly as he enjoyed it. He knew if Jesus died there, if God would allow his son to stay on that cross, if God would not remove Jesus in a rush of paternal anxiety, Satan knew that it was all over for him. If he could not keep Christ from the cross, Satan had lost and men and women everywhere had won. But you know, folks, Satan couldn't keep Jesus from the cross. And he couldn't bring Jesus down from the cross. He couldn't dissuade the Father. God was completely in control. And the events at Calvary would make God victorious. Now, regardless of your view of the day of crucifixion, have you ever wondered why we call it Good Friday? One would think we would call it Disgraceful Friday or Bad Friday or something. Why Good Friday? Because it was only a bad Friday for Satan. Oh, sure, it was pretty bad for Jesus, too, but his pain would be short-lived. Satan's defeat from that day would be eternal. Three days later, Jesus proved Satan had lost the war. Oh, that old dragon will continue the fight. What else could he do? But it's all academic now, folks. It's all academic now. The battles continue to rage, but the war is already won. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us.